All right, good afternoon and welcome to MOS Live. My name is Becca, my pronouns are she and her, and you're here for the virtual planetarium exploring space. Now I'm going to be your moderator today, which will means that I will be fielding any questions or predictions and passing them off to my fellow educators. If you're joining us here on Zoom and would like closed captions at any point, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and click show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Zoom and would like to ask any questions or share any predictions or comments, feel free to do that in the Q&A box. If you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube, thank you very much for being here. Unfortunately, we will not be able to see any of your questions or comments at this time, but we do appreciate that you're tuning in. So with that, I'm going to hide myself and have my educators introduce themselves. Hi everybody, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns and I'm gonna be your presenter today, but I cannot do this by myself. Hi everyone, my name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm gonna be your pilot today at flying you through space. And let's go ahead and jump into space, Katie. We're gonna start in a familiar environment. You will probably recognize our planet Earth. Uh, but we are not here to talk about Earth today. We are going to take a slightly bigger picture of things. So Katie, let's go ahead and leave the Earth behind. So as we pass out of our solar system, you'll see the orbits of the other planets, but even the solar system is a little too small scale for what we're talking about today. So as we leave the sun and the planets behind, we're gonna keep moving out because today we're talking about galaxies. Now there can be some confusion sometimes about the difference between a solar system and a galaxy. They're both quite important to us. Um, we live in a solar system, we also live in a galaxy. You can think of it as sort of being like your solar system is your, your hometown. It's where you live, your hometown. It's the, the area that's very important to you. And your galaxy as being more like your continent. So if our solar system is your hometown, the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy is more like North America. It contains hundreds of billions of stars, many of which have their own solar systems and is somewhere between uh, 100,000 and 150,000 light years across. Now, when I say light year, I'm talking about the distance that light will travel in a year. It's about 6 trillion miles. So, uh, the Milky Way is somewhere between 100 and 150,000 of those across. It's very, very, very large, containing hundreds of billions of stars. So this is an example of a galaxy. But if you want to talk about how galaxy, where galaxies come from, what forms they take, um, how they can evolve, you need to look at a somewhat bigger picture even than this. And it's really best to, as they say in Sound of Music, start from the very beginning a very good place to start. Now we can't quite go back all the way to the very beginning, the Big Bang, but we can go talk about what came shortly after that because we actually have data, which we like to call the baby picture of the universe because um, there is radiation in every direction surrounding us in all directions, which is called the cosmic microwave background. And that is what Katie is showing us here, all that colored, stuff that doesn't look like it makes much of anything. That is the cosmic microwave background. That is um, the radiation that is actually left over from the Big Bang and we can see it in every direction. And it doesn't look like much, right? It just looks like a kind of a hodgepodge of colors. But those colors indicate tiny little changes in uh, temperature in the very, very early universe. And those tiny little changes are very important because if the entire universe had been completely the same, then there wouldn't have been anything to push uh, molecules and atoms to start coming together, forming larger and larger objects, eventually forming stars, solar systems, and galaxies. But it wasn't completely uniform, as you can see here. Those colors indicate those tiny fluctuations, and that's important because those little tiny changes from one region to the other are what caused the seeds of galaxies to start to form back in the very early universe. This is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, this data that you're looking at. And from that, 
in the very early universe, we actually see surprisingly early in the universe, large galaxies starting to form. And that's actually something we're not quite sure how that happens, how galaxies got very, very big, very, very fast. Um, but they did. And if we look at the visible universe the way we see it today, we see galaxies in all directions and we see them at very different um, distances away. So Katie, let's take a look at the modern day universe the way we see it today. So each point of light that you can see here is a galaxy that we have observed and We've got sort of ones very close to the Milky Way, which we call the local group. Those are those bright green dots right in front of us. As we pull back, you'll see more and more dots appearing. These represent different data sets of galaxies, different um, telescopes going out and hunting for galaxies in the sky. These are all real galaxies that we have actually observed. And one of the interesting things is that um, because light takes time to travel, light doesn't travel instantaneously, the farther away from the Milky Way we look, the farther back in time we are seeing things. So for instance, um, if you were standing one light year away from me, I would always be seeing you exactly the way you were one year ago, because it would take a full year for your light to reach me. So if a galaxy is 10 billion light years away from us, we are always seeing it the way it looked 10 billion years ago, which means we're kind of looking back in time. And that's how we can look back in time and see what the early universe would have looked like by looking at these galaxies that are really far away and seeing what they look like. We are seeing what they looked like when the universe was very, very young. And you can see there's a lot of galaxies in the visible universe, about 2 trillion or so that we know of. And I say visible universe because this is, again, it takes light to time to travel. It can only um, make it so far over the course of time. You know, the universe has only been around for about 14 billion years. So there is more outside of this that we can't see that just the light hasn't had time to reach us yet. But here is just to give you an idea of how many galaxies there are out there. Now I have a question for all of you. Do you think, we've seen what our Milky Way looks like and our Milky Way is a great uh, example of a gorgeous galaxy. Do you think, yes or no, um, all galaxies are going to look similar to our Milky Way? And you can go ahead and put an answer in the Q&A. You can put a yes or no, or if you don't know idea, you can put a question mark because it's always okay to say that you don't know. All right, we're getting quite a few answers coming in. Um, most of them saying no, no, one very excited, no. Uh, every single one is saying no. And actually kind of along the lines, we do have a question from Harrison H5 wondering what the different types of galaxies are. So I think everyone's assuming that there are different ones. I'm so happy you asked that question, Harrison, because that's exactly what I'm gonna talk about now. So we've got all of these galaxies out there and you are all correct they do not all look like the Milky Way. Some of them do, some of them look completely different. So to start with, we're gonna talk about how we classify the shapes of galaxies. And to do that, I'm going to share my screen, steal it away from Katie. This is what we call the Hubble classification, which is um, a way that we classify galaxies based on shape. It's sometimes called the tuning fork diagram because you'll see it looks a lot like a tuning fork. And there are three main kinds, categories of gal galaxy shape. You've got your ellipticals, you've got your spirals, and you've got your irregulars, which are not on here, and I'll get to them later. Now ellipticals look like fuzzy balls, fuzzy eggs. Um, and we, each of these has sort of a subclassification. And for ellipticals, you can see it on the, the handle of the tuning fork. They're classified from E0 to E7 based on, are they circular or are they stretched out like a cigar? And I can go ahead and show you an example of each of those. So here are real galaxies out there, one of which represents a very good E0, almost perfectly spherical galaxy. And another, which is an E7, a very cigar shaped, stretched out elliptical galaxy. And um, what's Interesting is gal elliptical galaxies kind of come in one of two flavors. They're either kind of very small, we call them dwarf ellipticals, 
or they're huge and we call them giant ellipticals. There are some in the middle, but mostly you're either quite small or you're very, very big. And they get the very, 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 very big ones um, by combining smaller galaxies together. And this is actually uh, a fate that is in store for our Milky Way in about four and a half billion years. Does anybody happen to know what is on a collision course for the Milky Way in the next four and a half billion years? Go ahead and put your answer in the Q&A if you know. If you don't, feel free to put a question mark. We're still waiting for a few uh, answers to come in. I myself am wondering, I'm not even too sure. Uh, we have one guess for the Andromeda galaxy um, and maybe the sun exploding. We have a question mark. We have a well, whole bunch of uh, different guesses here, but not too sure the maybe. It's going to be running out of fuel, starting to run out of fuel in about four and a half billion years. Um, it's not going to explode but that's a subject for a different broadcast. Now Andromeda Galaxy is correct. It is our nearest large neighbor. And it's about two and a half million light years away from us. And it is on a collision course for the Milky Way. Now, when they collide, they're not gonna destroy each other. They're gonna combine. And eventually they're likely to form a, a galaxy like one of the ones you see on the screen here, an elliptical. That's what you get when you get large galaxies colliding together. Dwarf ellipticals are probably from a different source. They're probably from small spirals, like tiny versions of the Milky Way that actually have a larger galaxy pull off their arms, strip away the stars in their arms and leave the core behind. And that's, we think might be where dwarf ellipticals come from because galaxies actually interact and affect each other with their gravity a lot. So that's the ellipticals, so the big fuzzy round ones. Um, but if we go back to that tuning fork diagram, you've got the spirals as well on here. And they're the two tongs of the fork. And this diagram doesn't particularly talk about why there are two tongs, why there's two kinds of spiral galaxies. And the answer has to do actually with what the center of the galaxy looks like. Some uh, spirals have very, very nice round circular centers and others have very elongated stretched out centers. And when they have an elongated stretched out center, we call it a bar or a, and we call the galaxy a barred spiral. So that is what you see here, the two types of spirals. I'll go ahead and show you examples of those as well. So on the left here, we have M51 which is my personal favorite galaxy because it is so perfectly picturesque. It's also called the Whirlpool Galaxy and it is one of the prettiest things in the sky as far as I'm concerned. And it has this beautifully symmetric circular middle. And on the left or on the right rather, we have NGC 1300, which is an ex a fantastic example of a barred spiral. That center is not circular, that yellow area in the middle um, it is very stretched out into an elongated football shape. And we do think our Milky Way is a barred spiral. We think it has a bar across the center. So first way we classify spirals is to divide them into these two categories. Is it a regular spiral or is it a barred spiral? And then if you remember from the tuning fork, um, they even classified them even more into A, B, and C. And that just has to do with the fact that some uh, spirals are very tightly wound. You can see, for instance, M51, its spiral arms are nice and tightly wound around it. And others are very loosely wound and flinging their arms out to space. And you can see that NGC 1300 here is a good example of a loosely wound spiral. Its arms are not nearly as tightly wrapped around its center as, um, as M51. And we believe the Milky Way is kind of in the middle in between these two. It's what we would call a, a, an SBB, a spiral barred class B. So not tightly, tightly wound, but also not flinging its arms out into space as well. And before we move on, uh, Becca, are there any questions I ought to answer? There are a couple of questions that have come in. One is from Adeline, age five, and is wondering, um, what is the blackness in space? Well, blackness is ex exactly as you might expect from being in a dark room. It's the absence of light. 
It's just where we're not picking up any light. And that has to do with the fact that distances in space are so vast that anything that emits light, actually um, that light gets fainter and fainter and fainter as it moves out into space until eventually you can't really see it and it looks dark. So even though there's things all over the place emitting light, the distances in space are so big and space is not totally empty. There's things like dust out there, which also helps uh, make light go faint really, really quickly and can affect um, how we see the sky. And that's why the sky is dark at night. And speaking of things in space, we have a question here. One of my favorite questions, are there aliens or I guess really any other life form in not, space? Not that we know of. Um, we got some potentially exciting uh, evidence from Venus last week. There was an announcement um, that they had detected a gas which on Earth is created by life forms. And we don't have another great way to, you know, uh, explain how that gas got on Venus, but um, we don't have any solid evidence for life as we know it anywhere other than Earth, any kind of life other than Earth. Um, but we are looking, and I personally would be very excited if it turned out that Venus was the place where we would find it. I agree. I think that would be cool. Um, and then if we have time for a couple more questions, maybe even we well, can maybe one more, and then we'll we'll move on, and then we'll see if there's more questions later. Excellent, because we are getting in quite a few good ones. Um, and this question is a good one too. Are these pictures that we're looking at real? Yes, all the pictures I'm showing you are real. The tuning fork was um, artwork, so this is this is not real. But the pictures attached to it, those um, pictures above and below the tuning fork, those are real photos. These are real galaxies, our ellipticals, M87 and M59. And these two that I'm showing you here, these are also real photos, um, which I think were probably Hubble pictures. Um, they certainly came out of NASA, so probably Hubble. But um, yes, everything I'm showing you here are real photos. And we're going to move on and look at some more real photos because there is another kind of galaxy that we haven't talked about yet, irregular galaxies. And they're named that because they're a mess. They don't really have a shape. They're all over the place. Um, some of them are very, very small. Uh, these can be very, very, very tiny galaxies. In fact, if you look at the bottom center picture, you would barely call that a galaxy um, because some of these only have a few thousand stars in them and very little gas. So they're almost barely recognizable as galaxies. And the Milky Way has several of these orbiting around it and is in fact consuming one as we speak. So it's not like the Milky Way is just floating through space waiting to uh, collide with Andromeda in four billion years. It's actually surrounded by small dwarf galaxies right now and is in the process of taking one apart and making it part of itself. So that's what happens when you get a really big galaxy and a really tiny galaxy um, interacting. The big galaxy basically just eats the little galaxy and makes it part of itself. And so irregular galaxies as uh, their name suggests, don't really have a shape. Um, however, even these can be subdivided into classes based on how much do they not have a shape. So we call them irregular ones and irregular twos. So on the left here, we have an example of an irregular one. And on the right, we have an example of an irregular two. And basically it comes from the, the idea, does it look like it kind of once had a structure to it? So in the irregular one galaxy, NGC 1427A, um, you can see it almost looks like it's got, it had what could have been an arm off to the left side of the image. Um, and so this one's classified as an irregular one. It looks like it, it almost used to have structure and it looks like you might almost be able to say it still has structure. Irregular two, which is uh, our NGC 520 here really doesn't look like anything particularly at all. Even though in this case, we know that this one did used to have structure. NGC 520 was formed by two uh, colliding galaxies, two spirals colliding with each other formed this massive irregular shape. And uh, I also like to note that NGC 1427A, I can always see the Starfleet symbol in it. It always looks like it's got the Starfleet symbol you got right there. So I call it the Starfleet Galaxy. That is not its official name at all, but that's what I call it. So I've mentioned galaxy collisions a few times and they play a huge role in how galaxies evolve and grow. 
because our Milky Way did not form the size it is now. It grew, it evolved into the galaxy we see today. And it probably grew out of smaller galaxies colliding together, just like eventually it's gonna grow again by colliding with Andromeda and those two huge galaxies becoming one really enormous galaxy. And when galaxies collide, it can be quite spectacular. So once again, each of these is a real photo. These are pictures of galaxies colliding with each other. And what often happens is, the, is they start off with regular shapes and um, the gravity of the two galaxies, the way they interact with each other, will actually start to pull those shapes apart. So you can see some of these, you can tell they used to be normal looking spirals and then those arms started to get stretched out and pulled off. And eventually they collide and they merge and they, you don't have much of a shape. So you would probably call them an irregular and given enough time, their stars will settle into regular orbits and they will be one cohesive galaxy and they would probably be an elliptical. So galaxies go through many different forms as they grow and evolve and they can be at different points on that tuning fork diagram at different points in their life. So who knows what our Milky Way used to be? Right now it's a barred spiral. In four and a half billion years when it starts to collide with Andromeda, it's going to probably stretch out into a not particularly structured form. You might start to call it an irregular galaxy then. And then eventually once it's done combining with um, Andromeda, the, the combined final galaxy will be a giant elliptical. So galaxies grow and evolve. They move to different parts of that tuning fork as they grow and they can take many different shapes, but all of those shapes are beautiful. Galaxies are never not beautiful which is a uh, part of their charm. So that is what I have to say about how galaxies form and grow and evolve. And Becca, I am ready now for some more questions. All right, we do have a lot of really, really excellent questions. So hopefully we can get to as many of them as possible. So Harrison, age five, just read about dark matter and dark energy, and he would like to know what they are. I would love to tell you, Harrison, unfortunately, we call them dark matter and dark energy because we don't know what they are. We know that they're out there because we can see the effects that they are having um, on the matter that we can see, but we don't know what they are or what's causing them. So we know they exist, but we don't know what they are. So we call them dark matter and dark energy, but dark matter actually exists in large amounts around these galaxies. And in fact, both the Milky Way and Andromeda we think have huge halos of dark matter around them that extend so far out that in one sense, the Milky Way and Andromeda are already colliding to today um, because we think their dark matter halos have hit each other. We can't see it because we can't see dark matter. Um, so we can't really notice an effect, but we think based on our studies that those that get, in one sense, our galaxies are already colliding because of dark matter. Interesting fact. Awesome, thank you. Now kind of along a similar line, um, Addy age nine or seven is wondering, eventually will all galaxies collide? Not all, so galaxies live in groups. In fact, Katie, can you potentially show us um, your screen again? So you'll notice here is uh, Katie's showing us where these galaxies are in the universe, they're not, uniformly spread out. They're actually there, you can see clumps in them. And that's because galaxies live in clusters. And the galaxies within a cluster will eventually all collide. So we live in the little, our, like I said, our local group, which Milky Way and Andromeda are the big ones, but there are lots of other smaller galaxies in our local group. And eventually given enough time, all of the galaxies in the local group are probably going to combine and form a huge galaxy. But the clusters are moving apart from each other because of dark energy, actually. Um, so the clusters are not going to combine in general. So you're going to get each cluster eventually forming one giant super galaxy, but the clusters are moving away from each other, which means those giant super galaxies are probably not going to interact with each other. Awesome. And you sort of answered Ivory Age 8's question a little bit about what causes the galaxies to collide and what draws them apart to make them stretch. 
gravity, it's actually gravity in both cases. So as they're starting to collide, you'll see they did get into these very stretched out shapes. That's still because of gravity. It's because galaxies are so big that the, if you've got galaxy A and galaxy B, galaxy A is affecting the nearest part of galaxy B more than it's affecting the farthest part of galaxy B. So galaxy B actually winds up getting stretched out because the gravity of galaxy A is pulling on different parts of it at different, uh, in different amounts, just because galaxy B is so big and that's a big distance. So it's all gravity, but the thing that's forcing the clusters apart is um, dark energy, which and we're not quite sure how that works, but it's definitely out there. Awesome. Um, and we just have time for maybe just a few more. I know there are so many. Uh, can galaxy movement um, be tracked or track change over time like tectonic plates? So um, not exactly like tectonic plates, but we can, um, we can detect evidence of past interactions in the galaxy based on things like if there was a, a burst of star formation, you know, of certain amount of time ago, that's a pretty good bet that something triggered that and it could be an interaction with another galaxy. And we actually think, I read a, a theory, there's a little uh, dwarf elliptical galaxy that we think occasionally dive bombs the disk of the Milky Way because the way it interacts with the Milky Way is to sort of go up and down, up and down. And we think it dive bombed the disk of the Milky Way about 5 billion years ago which is about when our sun formed and our solar system formed. So there is a theory that that could be the thing that pushed um, our sun to form it was actually the gravity of a small dwarf galaxy interacting with the disk of the Milky Way. So we can see evidence. It's not quite as clear as the evidence for plate tectonics, but we can track some movements of galaxies over time. <clears throat> awesome. And I think we have time for just one more question. So I guess I'm gonna take exploring space, kind of in a little bit of a different uh, route here and talking about people in space. Um, and I'm, I, there's a question here about, do you change after you go to space that I'm curious about the answer to? You do definitely being in space um, affects the human body. And the longer you're in space, the more that you have that effect. So things like um, being in a low gravity environment will cause your spine to sort of decompress and you will get a little taller. Um, being in low gravity will cause your eyeballs to change shape and you might go a little nearsighted. Um, things like fluid doesn't come necessarily drain from your head. So you're probably gonna be congested and um, just, you know, because the human body was designed to live in earth gravity. So fortunately, most of that stuff reverses in time once you come back to earth. Um, they're still sort of studying the very long-term effects of flying in space because we've only been flying in people in space for about 60 years. And um, so we're only now getting to do really long-term studies of the effects of space travel. And you know, 60 years ago, they weren't sending them to space for months at a time. They were sending them for days or weeks. So we're still trying to figure out what the really long-term effects of space travel are. Um, but most of what happens to your body when you're in space will be reversed when you return to Earth gravity. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that answer. Unfortunately, um, we are just about out of time. So I am going to ask my fellow educators to say their goodbyes. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you both very much for being here and showing us on a little tour of space. And for the rest of the audience, thank you all for being here and for asking such amazing questions. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to every single question. I wish we had more time, but don't worry, you can check out mos.org slash mos at home to see any more virtual offerings we have and come back to another one of these in the future. And if you enjoyed this program and would like to support the museum, you can go to engage.mos.org slash welcome. And finally, this program was produced using Open Space, which is a free program that you can download yourself at www.openspaceproject.com. Once again, I want to thank you all very much for being here, and we will see you next time. <laughs>